It's not like saying that at all, but okay. yes, ex- exactly like that. Do I think about green it's monsters not. that fly around at night? No, I don't think about them. Yeah, I really don't understand what God is, and you're just saying stuff. Exactly, you're just you saying questions. stuff. Perfectly said. Ask Mr. Batman to unmute me, guys. May I ask you a question? Yeah, you may. Somebody asked Mr. Batman. Oriental dude, whose name I have no idea how to pronounce. It's in Hebrew. Okay, great. So, once again, sir, if you don't think about God, do you ever think about where do the laws of nature come from, which dictates how the physical world works? No. Because you're stupid. Have a nice day. I was going to say very low brain, but... Somebody ask Mr. Batman. Yep, not interested in talking to idiots like that. Next. Mr. Batman, please unmute me. Somebody ask Batman to unmute me. Someone ask Batman to unmute me. Someone ask Batman to unmute me. Are you guys unable to hear me? Everyone can hear you. Can you ask Mr. Batman to unmute me? You're a soul guy. Come on. Ask Batman to unmute me. I apologize for Oh, no. I can't hear him because I don't want to hear him. He called me a liar no, no, earlier no, I today. I know, Mr. Batman. I know. I know. He called me a liar earlier today. I don't talk to people who call me liars. You're out of here, sir, and I'm about to have you banned from this room. Hey, Mr. Batman. Yes, sir. Um... May I ask, um, so some, sometimes people ask me about God, who created God? How, how do you respond to that? Um, that's actually what's called a non sequitur. God is the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover. Since God created time, space, and matter, he must be outside of time, space, and matter. He's the cause for the effect of which time, space, and matter is. So nothing caused God because we see that in the Bible. God is the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav. That's the first and the last letters of the Greek and the Hebrew language. That means he's the beginning and the end. There's nothing that Uh, existed before God or nothing that will exist after. He lives in what's called the eternal time realm. We live in a different time realm. We call that the temporal time realm. Temporal because it's temporary. It had a beginning and it will have an end. God does not. Okay, so it would be ridiculous to engage with that question then. Yes, sir. Basically what you do is you tell them that that doesn't make sense Since God created time, space, and matter, and we're talking about temporal time, he did not create eternal time because that's where he's always lived. So God created temporal time, he created all space, he created all matter. So since he created time, space, and matter, that means by definition he must be outside of our temporal space, he must be timeless, spaceless, immaterial, all-powerful, all-knowing, a loving, living, logical, lawgiver, most high Elohim. Now, then you're going to ask them a question. Do you have one of those? And they're going to say no. Exactly, because they don't. Okay, I'm going to go back to the heretics uh, uh, thing and argue. Sir, if there's anything I can help you with and I happen not to be online, please feel free to email me or even call me if you need me. Because I teach apologetics professionally, and I'm happy to help you. It sounds like you're very, very versed in the Bible. I was asking you some questions before, and you were you were you were quoting verses like crazy. It's it's amazing. Thank you, sir. I wish I knew more because um, I've actually people will tell you this. I've had a brain injury, which I have, and I'm about ninety five percent recovered. But numbers sometimes still escape me. I don't remember the verse, but I won't remember the exact scripture reference. That just frustrates the living crap out of me. <laughs> well, you were telling me you were telling me with uh, Matthew verse five that it was a good it was a good uh, place to point to for people that were saying that we shouldn't follow the the old laws or, or the um, the Old Testament. And I I I went and I went and read it, and it's a very 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 good place to point to people that believe that. Absolutely. And that's not the only one either. When you look at Psalm 119, Psalm is the Old Testament, Matthew is the New Testament. 
The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. People will tell you that people like me who, who believe in the God of the Torah, that I don't believe in Paul or I don't believe in the New Testament. No, all of the Bible is necessary to understand any of it. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. In order to understand either one of them, you have to have both. In the book of the Revelation alone, there's 404 verses. In those 404 verses, it points to Old Testament scripture over 800 times. So if you don't know your Old Testament scripture, you're never going to understand the new. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. See you next time, Mr. Batman. Thank you, sir. God bless. God bless you. Mr. Batman. Yes, sir. May I help you? Yes. Uh, so to uh, know the script, uh, you, you said it's been verified many times, but you also alluded to that it's been translated because it has been translated. To know the script that, and to actually know the script, do I need to learn Hebrew? No, sir. You don't. We have many different uh, study tools that are available to you online. Um, there's blueletterbible.com. There's uh, eSword. There's hundreds of different resources, uh, concordances and things of that nature, where you can do word studies without having to actually speak the original language. What, what does that mean, word studies? Word study, and let me give you an example. If you go do and you look at Exodus chapter 20 where it says, thou shalt not kill. Well, yeah. that's that's not a bad translation. It's just not the best translation. So when you look at this and you go do a word study on that word kill, it means the taking of an innocent life. Is that the same thing as kill? No, it's actually murder. Thou shalt not murder. Yeah. So, also, so it's also, kind of like a study buddy. Yeah, basically it is. Also, I like, because I, I didn't know this, because I know Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right there, in the beginning, that's time. God, the agent behind the creation, created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. All time, space, and matter created in verse 1. Okay, let's go to verse 2. If everything talks about God, everything points to Jesus, how does verse 2 talk about Jesus? Because it says, and the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the surface of the deep. What the hell does that mean? Well, that word hovering, literally, if you look it up in the original language, I don't remember what it is in Hebrew, but it, it means brooding. It means what hens do to their eggs when they lay them. They warm them and spin them. They warm them and spin them. Wow. God created all time, space, and matter, and then he gave it all energy and spin. Did you know that energy is differences in temperature. Did you know that every molecule, every atom, every planet, every solar system, every galaxy has spin to it? So right there, that'll preach. You have God creating all time, space, and matter in verse one. And because you've done a word study on what that word hover means, it's brooding. It's an agrarian term, farming term. It's what hens do their eggs when they lay them. Now you know that when he created all time, space, and matter in the very next verse he gave it all energy and spin Woo, that'll preach how do you know that the uh, these website tools are accurate how do you verify this oh um that's easy you go to multiples of them if you're not sure if you think one might be off you go to a different one but most of them are using similar source material <clears throat> excuse me like the septuagint the masoretic text um, uh, oh shoot. What's the other one? Uh, I'm tired. So my brain's not quite working, but there's three or four basic texts that they use from, um, as a matter of fact, you might even go do a search through the, um, Dead Sea Scrolls and see how they match up to these particular scriptures. Most of them will have some, what's called variances, variances or difference in spelling, punctuation and things like that. But none of them, not a single one of them has a difference in the actual meat and taters, the actual meat of the message interesting um 
I know that the King James Bible really took a lot of uh, text out of the original. So, um, do you you said that you read the Torah. Does that supplement um, the text that is missing from the King James? Well, actually, sir, the King James didn't take a lot out. They didn't have a lot to work with when they started. You see, when King James, the 1611 King James was originally published, they didn't have all of the uh, manuscripts. As a matter of fact, they didn't have anything in the book of the Revelation. They created the book of the Revelation simply from writings of the church fathers. That's another thing you can know, a, re a reason we can know that we have what is accurate is because we could, re if, if all of the Bibles today were destroyed, and we still had the writings, the letters back and forth of the so-called church fathers. I don't like to call them that. I call them church heretics because they changed crap they weren't supposed to change. So, but anyway, even if we had only those correspondences, we could recreate the entirety of the scriptures, the entirety of the Old Testament and the New Testament, just from the correspondence of these people back and forth. But you said that they were, uh, I mean, I don't know if you said they're corrupt, but that's kind of what you alluded to. They, they had some yes, sir. They, they they would say, okay, yes, this is what the Old Testament says, but that they just wouldn't do it. They would quote it. They would quote Leviticus 23, but then they would say, well, that's just for Israel. We don't have to do that. Why did they think that? Because they didn't want to be anything like Israel. Well, but what they don't seem to understand is Paul even tells them in the New Testament that we are grafted in, that we are part of the commonwealth of Israel, that once you were far off, a stranger to the covenants of God, a stranger to the promises of God, but now because of the blood of the Messiah, you're brought near and you can be brought into the covenant of God. That's being part of Israel. So is Israel a place or is it a mindset? Both. Interesting. Um, Actually, it's not so much a mindset as it is a people. Now, when um, Moses brings Israel out of Egypt, did he bring the Israel, the, the land, or Israel, the people, out of Egypt? Well, the people, obviously. Yes, the people. And so now when Israel, the people, come out of Egypt, they had what's called the mixed multitude come with them. And God and Moses looks at God and says, uh, God, I got this problem. Got all these thousands of people, millions of people following me and they got all their thousands of stuff. What do I do? God says, if they will keep my commandments and keep my Sabbaths, then they can be part of Israel, just like a natural born Israelite. And they will be one Torah, one law for all people and one inheritance for all people. That's super important. Because guess what? That's who we are. We don't know what tribe we're from. I don't know what tribe I'm from, but I'm grafted in to the nation of Israel. How I'm part sure? of that mixed multitude that gets to come in because God said so. Well, how can you be so sure? Uh, if uh, I'm sorry, uh, I might have missed something that you said. I was yelling at my dog. Um, did you say that since we follow the word of Moses, we are grafted in or... No, sir. Anybody who follows the word of Moses, or was it just specifically the people that Moses led out of Egypt, or Israel, I should say? No, sir. It's not just, you know, see, here's the thing. If you, if you think you can do these things and be saved, you're wrong. That's a works-based mentality. You have to love God enough. You have to love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, to the point do you want to do these things you your your heart's desire is to obey every command given to you by your lord and savior by your master and you know what if you go out and do them any other way if you go keep every single commandment you never eat another piece of bacon you do everything god says to do yet you don't have love guess what you did it all for nothing no i don't like? do i don't do these things to get saved I do these things because I'm saying, why do you think they followed him out? They followed him out because they saw the works of this miraculous God who pummeled Egypt right to the very last thing that he did, which was the death of the firstborn son. So they said, this must be God. So we want him. We want to love and follow him. So then Moses was asking God, how can they do this? 
that if they already love, then now their next thing, if they love him enough to obey him, if they love him enough to follow him, then they have to love him enough to keep the commandments. Your keeping the commandments does not save you. Keeping the commandments is evidence of your salvation. There is a huge difference. So that's the minimum you can do. So um, who are the people of Israel? I am the children of Israel. I am. I'm part of that. How how do you, how can you be sure? Because I have a desire to keep the commandments. You see, I can't tell you this, sir. I can't, I can't give you a, a a broken down analogy or a formula says, see this, this is how it works. And boom, this is how, you know, Uh, you know what? I'll tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. What's your fruit? Your fruit is your obedience to the master. Now, once again, I love to obey. I love to keep the Sabbath. I love to keep the festivals. I love to wear my zitzits. You know what? Since I I have only been wearing the zitzits now for a couple months, but kids will come up and ask me. I've only had one adult, and that was a guy who was about half drunk in a bar, Come up and ask me, what the hell are those things hanging from your pants? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I got to talk to him about Jesus. Yeah, you know? that's, that's cool. So, again, um, I want to be different. And I don't do these things to be saved. I'm already saved. I can't be any more saved than I already am. But I love God enough to want to do what he tells me to do. Right. So, I'm sorry for kind of digging up the, the same thing over and over again, but sir, who, don't be sorry about that. You have honest questions. I, I, if there's any problem, it's me and me not being adequate enough with my answer. So please ask whatever you need. So um, technically who were the children of Israel? And the second part of the question is if you were not a child of Israel, um, technically you can still be saved by obeying God, right? No. You cannot be saved by obeying God. That is a works-based mentality. Now, uh, if you love God and you want to love God in your obedience, well, you know what? I'm going to tell you right now. I've only been a Torah-observant Christian or Hebrew for about the last five years. Was I any less saved for the 30 years prior to that? No, I wasn't. Because I loved Jesus. I've always loved Jesus. I was saved in the name of Jesus, even though I know his name is Yeshua, Yehoshua. I I was saved in the name of Jesus. Do I love him any less? No, I love him even more every single day. The fact of the matter is, um, I was still saved even though I wasn't keeping all the commandments. Now, here's the difference. If you get to be to that point where you you love God enough to where you say, I want to keep them all. I want to do them all. Guess what you get to do? You get to go to the marriage supper of the lamb. And I would refer you to the parable of the 10 virgins, five wise and five foolish. What, uh, um, what's the scripture number? Oh, to be completely honest, I don't remember, but if you look up 10 virgins, you'll find it. So I get 10 wives if I obey God. No, sir. That's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about it again, and I know you're not you're new to this. Yeah, I am. Uh, this is talking about the wedding. See, we as Israel are the bride, and all of the Bible is what's called a ketubah. It's a wedding document. It lays out the par- the parameters of what the husband will do and the parameters of what the wife will do. So that being said. When you have a wedding, what happens? You have a wedding party and you have the bridesmaids. So these bridesmaids are the 10 virgins that are waiting in a room outside of the wedding uh, home, outside of the home that's going to house the wedding. They're all sleeping. All of them went to sleep. And so when they all went to sleep, some of them brought extra oil for their lamps and some of them did not. Now, wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Where does this oil come from? Well, let me help you. It comes from olive trees because it's olive oil. That's what they have out there in that area. Olive trees, olive oil. How do they get this olive oil out of the olives? Because it's a fruit. 
it must be crushed. That's called tribulation. Phlebo is the Greek. So when they hear the announcement, make way, make uh, straight the path of the groom because here comes the groom. And then all the lights, they can see all the lights. So the wise virgins get up and trim their wicks. <coughs> they add their extra oil and they're ready to go. The, the five foolish ones say, hey, wait a minute, our lamps are about to go out. Give us some of yours. And that, you know what they said? They didn't say, okay, sure, I'll help you out. No, they didn't. They said, you go to the city and buy. That's a euphemism for go learn more. Le learn what you should have learned to begin with. Because uh, if we give you ours, we won't have enough to go in. So the five foolish ones, they went to town to go buy or learn what they needed to learn. Go through the tribulation and learn about tribulation the way they're supposed to. Then they come back. When they come back, the doors to the wedding celebration are already shut. Now, all 10 of them are in the camp. I used to think that the five foolish ones were five uh, atheists, but no, all 10 of them are saved. All 10 of them are in the camp, but only five of them get into the marriage supper of the lamb. The other five stay out in the darkness, where there, the outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth because they don't get to come in to where the inner part is, where the intimacy is, where there's the party, where the wedding ceremony is being held. Why? Because they weren't prepared. And that's 90% of the church today. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with the, the statistic that you put out. Um, what, um, what? I've never heard the story before. Where is it? Obviously the Bible, but... One moment, um, I'll look it up. Okay, okay. So do they ever get saved or are they always forever dashing their teeth? Oh, no, no, no. Yes, sir. They are part of the, they're part of the group. They're part of the saved group. They're in now, the darkness, though. But wait a minute. The darkness is just the outer darkness. Where is all the light going to be when the wedding ceremony is going to be happening? Where is the menorah? The menorah is the um, seven-candled candelabra. Where is that going to be? It's going to be inside the wedding ceremony of the Lamb. The wedding supper of the Lamb. So all the lights on the inside, you could see it, but you're in the outer part in the outer darkness. It's not hell. I used to think that too. It's not hell. They're part of the camp. They are saved, but they they are saved in the most flimsy of ways. You know, there's people who say, well, I love Jesus. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I believe in Jesus and I put my faith in Jesus. But then when it comes right down to it, they don't want to do what Jesus asked them to do. You know what? Jesus still loves them enough to save them. I, I used to think otherwise, but I don't anymore. Jesus okay. still loves them enough to save them, but they're not invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's some people who get in by what the Bible calls the skin of their teeth. How can we well, be so sure we want to go to the uh, wedding? I always want to go to a wedding, sir. Have you ever been to a wedding that has been boring? Well, I've been to a wedding where I've been embarrassed, but... Um, not boring. Well, well, I'm in a, shoot, sir. I'm good at embarrassing myself wherever I go. That's yeah. not the issue. The issue is if I'm going to the wedding supper of the king, and not only am I going to the wedding supper of the king, but I'm part of the wedding party, which I'm going to be, because we as the church are going to be the bride, I'm going to have the most fun I can possibly have. How do you know you're going to be the bride? I don't. But oh I no! I'm idea. saying that how do you know the idea that I'm going to be a part of the um, I'm going to be part of the bride because I'm the one of the few. How many people do you know like me, sir, who wear zitzits, who keep the festivals, who tell other people to do the same? How many people like me do you know? Well, that, that that's not evidence of anything, but zero. Yes, actually, it is, sir. Now I'm going to ask you again: How many people like me do you know? I said zero. Great. See, sir, it narrow and difficult is the way to salvation and few will find it. Why? Because hardly anybody's looking. How do you know that God is just? Oh, that's easy. If God wasn't just, then how do you know it's wrong to be a pedophile? Matthew uh, chapter 25. Okay, I, I'm going to say, I just don't understand the, the question. I'm sorry, sir. If you're talking about justice, 
We're going to talk about justice now. How do you know God is just? Wouldn't you agree that being a pedophile is always going to be wrong? Yes. Wouldn't you agree, sir, that murdering an innocent child just because you feel like murdering them is always going to be wrong? You're um, hesitating uh, on that well, one, sir. That's kind of scaring me. About it. Well, yeah, of course. I'm, I'm trying to think about it. Because um, whenever somebody says always, I, I kind of am hesitant. Wait a minute, sir. I said always on the pedophile thing, and you didn't hes did not hesitate. So yes, why is Why is the murder of a young child any different than being a pedophile? Because America murders children. In the I don't give a crap time. what America does, sir. Do you know it's wrong? If you had a four-month-old baby in your arms and all of a sudden you just decided, you know what, I'm going to throw this baby in, in the, the compactor, the trash compactor, and see what happens. Is that wrong? Yes. Great. That's much better. See how easier that, much easier that is? Because people take into consideration abortion. You're brainwashed to do so. Now, once again, sir. You know that these things are wrong. Helen, where does that come from? Child. Go off. Like, go off. Well, I always go off. Where does that come from, sir? How do you know that these things are wrong? Well, I know a fetus is not a child. Well, um, how do I know these things are wrong? Yes, sir. Uh, um, that's a good question. I never really analyzed that, to be honest. I never really dug in myself to figure that out but i would uh, would assume that a lot of the western morality for instance comes from um the bible and i know that that is true um, hang on a second know. sir hang on a second hang on a second i didn't ask you where western morality comes from you said oh. you knew it was wrong to, uh, to be a pedophile you knew it was wrong to f throw a four-month-old baby into a trash compactor just to see what happens I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to the Western society. I'm not talking to a biblical nation. I'm talking to you. How do you know it's wrong? I don't, I guess. There you go, sir. Now you've got a problem. You're asking me about a just God, but you don't know anything about justice. That's true. Now, uh, sir, once again, I'm just getting passionate because, again, you're going down a path that actually is argumentative. Oh, I'm happy to be argumentative, sir, and you won't like it because I win every argument I'm in when it comes to the Bible. Well, of course, I'm not. I'm not trying to argue with you about the Bible, and I, I, I was my 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 brow was becoming furled because <laughs> you called I me out. The, uh, and and to be completely talk. honest, sir, I got to tell you, I I'm enjoying our conversation. Don't please don't take it any other way because you have honest questions, but your honest questions do. Um, incur in me a very passionate response sometimes. Just take oh, it that way. Yeah, yeah, you like to now, humor the idea of Matthew dead chapter twenty-five. That's where the parable of the ten virgins are. Uh, say that one more time. Uh, Barry Jack was talking over you. Matthew chapter twenty-five, starting at verse one. I'm just writing that down. It says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lambs and went to meet the bridegroom. Now, right there should tell you something. The kingdom of heaven will be like, huh? Why will the kingdom of heaven be like this? Because guess what? This is exactly what it's going to be like. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. You know what? There's so many foolish people in the church today that don't obey God, don't want to read their Bible. They go in, they give their 45-minute nod to God every once a week, and they say, I'm good, God, thank you very much. And I don't know if they're saved or not. But I do know one thing. They sure aren't following him the way they're supposed to. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with them. That flask of oil is olive oil. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. All of them fell asleep. The wise and the foolish both fell asleep. But at midnight was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. All those virgins, ro virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. But all the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. 
But the wise answer saying, since there is not enough for us and for you, uh, you go rather to the dealers and buy some for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. The marriage supper of the Lamb, and the door was shut. This is part of the marriage festival. When they shut the door, like, no, it's locked. Know. It's locked for seven days. Afterwards, the other virgins came along saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he said, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Wow. That's a, yeah, wow. Interesting. Um. You, you've explained why the oil is important. It just it just went over my head, and I'm not too. In, I'm I'm, I, I'm interested in. It. I just don't want to keep going over the same point. No but, problem, sir. Um, I don't mind going over that because it is extremely important to understand this. It's, it's quite confusing. Okay, um, I've never seen oil at a wedding before, like that. Well, you won't at today's weddings because most weddings are lit by electricity. Now, think about this: in the day of the first century. Where did they get their oil for their lamps? They got them from the olive tree. Yes. The olives from the olive tree. What is an olive? It's, it's a, a fruit. fruit. Yes. And how do you get oil from that fruit? You crush it. That's called flebo. That's tribulation. So once again, you must have fruit. You must have good fruit in order to produce the, the oil. These five foolish virgins did not have any fruit. They did not have any good fruit to produce oil, so they had to go buy some. They had to go get it. Now, the five wise ones that had gone through the tribulation, had the, the extra oil, had the, the fruit of the Spirit. You can look at it that way. They were able to go in and be with the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you know there are going to be some that are going to be part of the bride? I might not be part of the bride, but there's going to be others that are going to be part of the wedding party. I might be part of the wedding party. I don't know. Why, why do you think that uh, some will when be do part I of the get bride? Part? Well, um, again, the bride is the one who has the most intimacy with Jesus. He is the one, or he or she is the one that wants to love Jesus to their full abilities. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I try my best, but am I doing it? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I think I can do better. On your knees. Yeah, sir, you um, speak over me. But, you get muted in here, and I'm tired of your speaking over me. That's the third time. Now, so once it comes right down to it, am I going to be part of the bride? I don't know. I hope so. But if not, right. I do know this. I do know that I'm doing, and I'm not trying to compare myself. I'm not trying to say I'm better than anybody else. But I'm just saying that I am at least trying to love God in the best way I can, and teach others to love God how they should love him. Wait, you don't uh, have assurance in your salvation, hold really? Hold up. No, please mute that guy. Uh, the question I have You're is... asking a question? Why do you think that... Well, I'm trying to talk with them. Why do you think that... I'm, I'm sorry, and it just sounded like a, a terrible question, to be honest. It sounded like it was you were trying to argue. That's true, it is. And, and I do have assurance of my salvation. What I'm not exactly sure of is exactly where I'm going to be. Am I going to be in, in the bridal chamber or, or am I going to be in the bridal party? I don't know. How do you know that God, God wants to, to marry uh, those who follow the Bible, those who follow God's word, those who love God? Ah, that good question, sir. Because if you look in the Old Testament, when God gave us his law at Mount Sinai, what did he have all the people do? He had them dress and clean, get clean. Cleaned up, dressed, completely bathed, and dressed in pure white. Why does a virgin, why does a newly married woman wear white at her wedding? Purity. Purity. Righteousness. And you know what? In Revelation, it talks about the same thing. And those who are part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, they put on their white robes. So there's also a parable about this. Parable says, and the king sent out all his servants and said, okay, my son's uh, wedding ceremony is now ready. Send, uh, invite the guests. Well, the guests said, no, I'm, I'm too busy. I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, they, they snubbed the king. Well, the king says, okay, fine. I'll just invite everybody. So he goes out to the highways and the byways and invites everybody that will come. Everybody that will come can come. But see here in that culture, you got to understand 
that the king provided for your wedding garment. You didn't have to pay for it. Right. And so now that the king has provided for your wedding garment, you're ready to go in. Now, he's roaming through the wedding party and he sees this guy without a wedding garment. He says, hey, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he, he's speechless. He says, servants, take him hand and foot, bind him hand and foot, and cast him out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because yeah. they did, it's not that he's going into hell. He's going out to the outer part. He's part of the saved ones, but he's not part of the wedding party. Why would see, Adam the wedding work? party, the wedding guests, and then there's the 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 uh, the the bride them herself. And I don't know if I'm part of that. I, I can only hope. Right. Why would um God give Adam Eve? Then why would he? Because adultery or not? Uh, I think I think it's called adultery is against God's word. Well, um, there was no adultery between Adam and Eve. I don't understand the question. I, I thought oh, that they were uh, married. I thought, oh, not married, but, you know, I thought they were blood, you know, of the same blood, you know, they uh, would have sex. That's irrelevant if there's only, like, two of you, you know. I, I'm sorry, sir. I still don't understand the question. Adam. Why, why would Adam, or why would God make Adam, or why would God make Eve from Adam's rib to have us multiply? Because that's the way he did it, sir. He, was lonely, he did bro. so. Let me let me give you a reason why. He didn't take. Oh, yeah. He wanted to create uh, Eve, the perfect partner for Adam, from Adam. So he is, she is part of him. So right. they can be one flesh. You ever heard that before? 